And um, my remarks um, draw from U.S., Japanese, Indian, British, Taiwanese uh, government sources, and also the literature, and also a number of experts that I've consulted with in developing this analysis. I focus on China with the full recognition of the important regional roles played by India and Japan, as explained by my colleagues uh, uh, in previous days. Multiple futures are possible for China. Each one is path dependent and reflects distinct choices and trade-offs. The questions at hand are, given the likelihood of moderate growth and an aggressive foreign policy, what's the best course of action to assure that the interests of the United States and its allies and international norms are protected in Asia? What are the most significant economic and foreign policy trends in China? Where will Chinese policy retain its current direction? And in which areas should we expect change? And what are the most pertinent scenarios and most likely outcomes? And how do they apply to US strategy uh, in, in the region? So let me begin uh, with a comment on the economy, and then we'll go to a number of other areas, demographics, the Communist Party, um, and, and so on. China has been mired in a slow motion economic crisis over the past four years. This has only recently been widely recognized outside of China, but it was known inside of China. Even as late as 2010, 2011, most China specialists failed to see the uh, systematic over-reliance on credit, the failure of consumption to spur growth, and a susceptibility uh, to non-productive investment. These are the characteristics of the economy uh, that um, uh, people failed to see. Over the next decade, economic analysts project, project that uh, the 6 to 7 percent GDP growth rates that the Communist Party is uh, talking about, these will prove impossible to reach without accelerated consumption or dangerous increase in debt. Those are the two ways that they might do it. These are complex choices. For Xi Jinping, especially when doubts about his leadership have arisen with stock market declines, rising unemployment, and rising disapproval about his uh, crackdown on dissent. And as you're aware, uh, the uh, attorneys, the lawyers for um, dissenters have been uh, arrested, detained, and are being tried. They've also uh, uh, a number of booksellers in Hong Kong have been arrested and uh, imprisoned by the Chinese. As I mentioned in previous remarks, uh, compared to previous periods, estimates for Chinese economic growth over the next 15 years are bleak. Uh, and to quickly, very quickly recap that, the Development Research Council in Beijing expects growth to drop to 6% uh, by 2020. The U.S. Conference Board says it will average 3.7% uh, between 2019 and 2025. Uh, Michael Pettis, a distinguished professor in Beijing, uh, thinks it will slow to about 3 to 4% over the next decade. Uh, the workforce itself declined by 3.5% last year. And Fitch Ratings has downgraded China's debt. I mentioned that earlier, but I want to remind you of it. China's continuing heavy dependence on debt-fueled investment will act to limit GDP growth, bringing heightened social tensions and the fear of job loss to ordinary Chinese citizens. 
Yet among elite interests, like the state-owned enterprises, the princelings, the sons and daughters of senior officials, and so on, and the elite members of the People's Congress, among those people, there is resistance to the government's reform agenda, and progress has been further stalled by Li Keqiang, who is an uncertain and historically weak premier. Despite these pressing domestic policy problems, China's economy, second largest in the world, continu continues to pursue its overseas interests. Recall, if you will, that it was the search for natural resources to fuel industrial growth, markets to buy manufactured goods, bases to protect them, that led to the colonization of Asia, Africa, and Latin America by European powers in the 18th and 19th centuries. These three things, resources, markets, and bases, usually go together. Trade, markets, resource extraction, port and infrastructure development are also the key ingredients of China's foreign policy today. As the United States pivots to Asia, however, China is pivoting to the West, towards Africa, towards the Middle East, towards Russia, Southwest and Central Asia. Uh, and it's looking for resources, markets, and bases in regions where it faces little competition from the United States and its allies. As in the past, the new great game is about economic expansion and about having pliant and friendly regimes in resource supplier nations with port access. Three centuries of Anglo-American mar maritime dominance seem to have caused a certain degree of land blindness among policymakers. Meanwhile, Asia's geopolitical center of gravity is shifting inland with implications for the maritime powers. Mahan, remember Admiral Mahan. Mahan matters, but so does Mackinder. Notwithstanding the focus on maritime expansion, new economic hubs are changing the geopolitics of Eurasia as part of its Go West strategy, which China calls One Belt, One Road. Beijing plans to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to create an economic hub and spokes system in continental Asia via pipelines, highways, and rail links from China to Central, Southwest, and Southeast Asia. These spokes, or arteries, would bring in raw materials and energy resources and export Chinese manufactured goods to these regions and beyond. Beijing would like to say that One Belt, One Road marks China's coming of age as a superpower. Uh, reflect, and in some way, it reflects, this policy reflects the principles of the ancient Chinese game of Go, uh, because it's presented as Chinese China's strategic response to Washington's Asia pivot. So as Washington pivots to Asia, China is spreading out, as it were, across Asia and towards Europe, and there's a go-like quality to it. The projected economic zone contains a population of 4.4 billion people, with 26 countries and regions. China hopes that in the next 10 years, its exports will account for one-third of the imports from these countries, while Beijing says it intends to invest $1.6 trillion in this process. Beijing's One Belt, One Road project would create separate land and sea transportation corridors that would connect Europe and attempt to thwart encirclement by hostile powers. China's Maritime Silk Road is both an economic development plan and also an attempt to break the U.S. Navy's control of the Lombok 
Straits and the Straits of Malacca. The land route through China, the Stands, Eastern Europe, and on to the West would enable Beijing to reduce the reliance on the maritime checkpoints, choke points, and those really are choke points. If you look at the, at the map, uh, the U.S. Navy could block those straits and prevent China from bringing, from exporting goods uh, uh, to the south and into the Indian Ocean. Um, supplementing these China-centered transport networks would be Chinese-built ports along the Indo-Pacific sea lanes to enhance Beijing's influence and to support the People's Liberation Navy blue water effort. This very ambitious long-term plan is today little more than lines on a map and a high-energy public relations program. By framing its intentions, China once again uses language to structure perceptions about its plans and so positions itself within the global discourse. Whether such, such progress is made by 2030 uh, remains to be seen. Of course, One Belt, One Road does nothing to alleviate the pressing problems of declining GDP, excessive credit, and China's stagnant workforce in the near term. A second critical issue for us to think about going forward are China's demographic trends. While it's estimated that China's population will remain steady until 2030, it will begin to decline after that point. China will have net negative population growth between 2030 and 2050. A crippling combination of three demographic trends. First, low fertility rates. Uh, second, fewer entrants into the workforce. And third, that one in five Chinese citizens will be aged 65 by 2030. Those three things have placed China on the verge of a structural transformation even more profound than the long and painful project of economic restructuring. The demographic dividend, and that's an important phrase for you to remember, it means that the, the economic growth that can result from shifting in a population's age structure when the share of the working age population, namely those people from 15 to 64 years old, when that share is larger than the non-working uh, population, meaning 14 and younger, 65 and older, uh, that demographic dividend will come to an end in about 15 years. And it is that demographic dividend that stimulated fantastic growth that we've seen in China until this point. The demise of the demographic dividend will have a distinct impact on productivity and is expected to affect foreign direct investment into China by the year 2030. These factors will also place stress on the large number of Chinese parents who will not be able to rely upon their children in old age. China's inaction in the face of its impending demographic crisis uh, has reflected both a lack of understanding of the changing demographic reality and resistance among the Chinese, uh, the, the country's birth control bureaucracy, which formerly employed half a million people. So you have a real vested interest in that birth control bureaucracy. And it was because of them that it took so very long to do away with the one-child policy. The looming demographic crisis will largely define China in the 21st century and poses a critical threat to China's future economic growth, its political stability, and its military manpower pool, all of which will negatively impact China's military readiness in the year 2030. 
Japanese interlocutors focus on the rapid transition from high fertility and high mortality to low fertility and low mortality. They maintain that even though the one-child policy is abolished within China, the burden on society will remain. The damage is largely done. It's already done. Considering the party's commitment to urbanization, it faces an increase in the demographic burden in which one worker will be obliged to support two parents and four grandparents, as I mentioned to you the other day. And this frightens a lot of people in China. Now let's turn to the Communist Party. President Xi Jinping has rejected the tradition of collective leadership and established himself at the pinnacle of a highly centralized system. He's used the what he's called the mass line campaign that relies on the nostalgia for the Mao era and heightened nationalism to try to restore the stature and legitimacy of the party. His support within the Politburo is less reliable today than it was when he took office. A principal problem is Premier Li Keqiang, who has proven unable to manage the economic transition that Xi Jinping envisions and has brought, uh, and, and the difficulty in that has brought interpersonal tension between the president and the premier. Xi's effort to impose strict party management and his apparent attempt to revive the kind of authoritarian rule that Mao practiced has deeply unsettled the party. A 2013 internal party survey highlights that one-third of the cadres <coughs> who have held a ministerial level position have committed graft-related offenses, which equates to nearly 10,000 officials. That's an awful lot of people to uh, be under examination. There's considerable Japanese interest in the tensions resulting from the anti-corruption campaign in the middle and upper levels of the Chinese Communist Party, where provincial and prefecture level party officials fear prosecution. These fears are seen to have more traction today uh, than other challenges facing the party, such as ideology and direction. Although analysts within Japan argue that the party is not falling apart because, strong, because of strong enforcement mechanisms that would shore up the rank and file, it is thought that she may have overstepped his authority and his capacities by using the campaign for overt political purposes. Xi's political objectives went beyond merely targeting political opponents. He cleverly nurtured the social media, which covered the public show trials, including the proceedings shown on television, to anger the population who quickly condemned officials who are leading opulent, illicit lives and in effect isolate them from their political base. This was a very clever and complex move by Xi. But what he managed to do was to mobilize the anger of the broad population against uh, flamboyant behavior by senior officials with limousines and mistresses and all of the kind of accoutrements of power that that they have, and he's turned that against them and separated them from their sources of support. Um, let me turn here to the anti-corruption campaign itself. It's widely agreed that corruption within China has reached unprecedented levels. In 2013, the party punished more than 182,000 people, officials, for corruption. 50,000 more than the annual average of the previous five years. Xi Jinping's extensive anti-corruption campaign has impacted party officials and particularly political opponents throughout the system, many of them who had devoted themselves to the party for decades. 
and they've seen the rewards that went to their predecessors, they know that those rewards will not be available to them. And there are reports of suicide and early retirement and so on. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. While the campaign has introduced fear at all levels of society, it's had a particular impact uh, among the wealthy. And I mentioned to you previously uh, this curse of the rich list. People don't want to be seen to be, to be wealthy. Um, Xi's campaign has destabilized both the elites and the lower ranks of the party, targeting what he calls tigers and flies, brought down uh, Politburo Standing Committee members, security, national security chief, um, major party bosses, and so on. Japanese observers maintain that corruption in China it occurs at all levels of the government, it's unprecedented, and several interlocutors offered counterintuitive argument, namely that corruption in China also has the effect of enhancing efficiency. Uh, in other words, corruption lubricates decisions and allows things to get done. Serious doubts remain, however, that Xi's campaign will have long-term effects, and most observers remain skeptical that Xi's efforts will eradicate the deep cultural and age-old patterns of, uh, that support corruption uh, in the foreseeable future. Now, I'm turning to the question of China's identity. Remember, we're looking at this going forward. The question of China's identity is not a simple one. The party must advance values, goals, and themes that unite 55 ethnic groups, 55 minority groups in China, and fashion a national identity that functions as a social adhesive to bind these otherwise disparate social and ethnic groups together. Over the next two decades, there will continue to be multiple elements that condition China's identity. Nationalism and the theme of national rejuvenation, uh, statism and social media will play particularly important and transformative roles. Grievances and outbursts of social unrest among ethnic minority populations in China will continue to challenge the party's legitimacy, its governance, and its ongoing effort to forge a national identity through education and efforts to impose a common language. Now, um, the efforts at education and the common language, we ought to talk about in the Q&A, uh, if you like. China's national identity today is shaped by many facets, some of which are conflicting, some are complementary. Na notions concerning the centrality and moral superiority of China lie at the heart of the contemporary struggle over what it means to be Chinese. These notions draw on the teachings of the traditional moral political model in China, of which there are two main elements. The first, according to the Confucian ethic, requires each person to exhibit proper behavior, ceding absolute authority to the ruler, who in turn is morally bound to treat each person properly. The second element holds that to be Chinese is to be part of a civilization that has pride of primacy in the world. Although most modern Chinese implicitly accept these points, controversy remains over whether this traditional model applies or should apply to modern China. Nationalism is a critical element in China's national identity today. China marks the beginning of its journey into modern nationhood with the loss of national greatness during the period the century of humiliation. And here the industrialized West introduced ill-suited ideas of democracy and human rights, which contradicted aspects of the traditional moral political model. China's political elites, in turn, crafted an identity narrative 
that seeks to achieve unity by referencing foreign exploitation and victimization, even as the nation has transformed itself into an economic powerhouse over the past three decades. Today there's evidence that identity issues in China are moving beyond internal debates about nationalism to debates characterized by statism. And this discussion promotes China as a regional and global power with the growing prospect of reclaiming the nation's lost wealth and status. The identity struggle in China today must accommodate several uh, evolving concepts, including the China dream, the China model, Western ideas of democracy, human rights, and socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's a lot to, it's a lot to mix into the same bowl. It's uh, often contradictory, sometimes perplexing. In 2012, the China dream came to the fore as a particularly prominent feature of Xi's administration's attempts to fashion an identity for China based on Xi's vision for wealth and national pride and obedience to authority. The exact, the exact goals of the China dream include to foster national unity, namely keeping Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, reclaiming Taiwan, and securing the claimed areas of the South and East China Seas. So that's fostering national unity. Second, strengthening the Communist Party. Uh, make the party state more efficient. Crack down on corruption. Improve living standards. Modernize the military and increase China's regional and global weight. In recent years, the popular Western view of a confident China rising has gathered momentum. However, this perception is dangerously superficial. Within China, the themes that the party uses to condition national identity, namely strident nationalism, the need for rejuvenation, and the Sinocentric view of sovereignty, have achieved only limited traction among the population. While nationalism has been effective in generating support for Beijing's policies in the South China Sea and toward Taiwan and towards Japan, the younger urban middle class is united by a vibrant Western-derived materialism. The embrace of materialism clashes with decades of government-sponsored anti-Western indoctrination which asserts that the West is more hostile, more a hostile rival than it is a friend. Thus, with an apparent decoupling of ideology and identity, the new emerging identity is not exactly what the party had hoped for. It's an irony there, isn't it? It's likely that the party approved China dream will continue to lack the moral component people can use to guide their daily lives in civil society. Moreover, the concept of citizenship will continue to pose a threat to the party's authority, as it implies that domestic populace have rights and responsibilities and enjoy a degree of autonomy, which makes the party quite uncomfortable. Nevertheless, for China to establish itself as a truly global player, it needs an inclusive definition of being Chinese based on allegiance to a set of values that can be uniquely Chinese or universally valid or both. Not only does the absence of such a definition make China less coherent, failing to bind its citizens together in any meaningful way, but it also complicates China's leadership efforts both regionally and globally, by failing to present itself as a nation capable of leading from within and setting an example that others might emulate. 
Demands for a greater voice in government by Tibetans, Uy and Uyghurs, uh, and Hong Kong, and early steps in Taiwan toward independence will continue to challenge the official party-approved concepts of national identity well beyond 2030. Protests will thus continue in China's neglected regions and be met with force by the Han authorities, a pattern of instability and violence likely to continue to 2030 and beyond. Now, a word on China's, uh, what I call China's dysfunctional diplomacy. Uh, pressures have authored changes in both the tone and the objective, the objectives uh, of China's policies in East Asia, rendering its regional diplomacy dysfunctional. China has aggressively claimed, as I told you earlier, 900,000 square miles of the South China Sea and the territory and resources within it, despite the claims of other nations. It has probed U.S. intentions, U.S. resolve, and willingness to defend Japan, the Philippines, and Taiwan, and has attempted to loosen U.S. alliances by putting U.S. relations with Japan, Malaysia, India, Burma, and others in play. Moreover, these policies and China's land reclamation program specifically have, have riled Washington, nearly causing the cancellation of President Xi's September visit. China has attempted to expand its South China Sea presence, as we learned earlier, by building runways and radar stations and military facilities on these sandy atolls. Uh, formerly, these places are claimed by six other countries. Uh, in the Spratly Islands and in the uh, Paracels. While intended to advance China's de facto, de facto control and enhance its strategic presence in the contested waters, in fact, uh, uh, it's clear that it has become a real liability. Just as China is launching initiatives like the, the uh, new maritime Silk Road and the Asia Infrastructure Bank, foster regional development, cultivate goodwill, its South China Sea policy creates friction, friction and fear and undermines its position in the region. Um, I mentioned to you the example of China's seizure of islands in the Paracels in 1974 from Vietnam and the fact that Vietnam continues to claim these islands, continues to harass uh, China in uh, uh, bilateral discussions and in multilateral settings. And uh, I think we, we believe that uh, what China is doing at the moment uh, will create an irritant going well into the future. It's not going to stop now or in 2030 or beyond that. Um, and China's military and maritime buildup have driven a regional defense buildup, which is not a good thing. Uh, the money going into defense budgets now is uh, without question higher than it has been in previous years and is likely to continue. Um, let me turn to China's search for resources. In the context of China's potentially crippling socioeconomic political challenges, uh, resources, particularly oil, gas, and coal power, are critical to social and political stability. Over the next 15 years, China will continue to look towards beyond its borders for its energy needs as consumption outpaces domestic production. The quest for energy will condition China's behavior in Africa, Latin America, uh, Russia, the Middle East, and certainly the Arctic, as well as in India and most notably the South China Sea, where China's foreign policy uh, centers 
particularly on acquiring oil. China's recent attempts to secure new resources, for example, by deploying the Haiyang Shayu 981 deep water and semi submersible drilling rig off the coast of Vietnam. This happened in May of 2014. It brought criticism and alienated regional counterparts, suggesting that tactics and strategy may be at odds in China. And you have to wonder what sort of strategy they had in mind when they deployed this oil rig, knowing that it would create outrage, uh, not just with uh, Vietnam, but with Malaysia and Indonesia and all of the other countries in, in the area. It was a blatant seizure, uh, or attempt to seize, uh, oil beneath the South China Sea. Over the next decade, it's critical for China to reduce its dependency on coal, coal, which amounts for nearly 70% of China's energy consumption. One of the main alternative energy sources being explored in China is shale gas. However, because of China's ability to extract its own domestic supply of natural gas is limited, further cooperation with the United States will be necessary to tap into the shale reserves. Such cooperation is made more urgent by the U.S. Navy's ability to control the Strait of Hormuz and the Balakan and Lombok Straits, critical passages for China's oil supply. China's efforts to explore natural gas fields near the Japan-China median line in the East China Sea and its aggressive claims to the fish, minerals, and other resources in the seabed are of great concern to the Japanese, who observe that domestic and political pressures, environmental concerns, and rising demand for portable fuels mean that China's foreign policy will prioritize the acquisition of new resources uh, over bilateral relationships. So what does all this mean for China in 2030? Multiple futures, as I said, are possible. They're all path dependent. It depends upon what kinds of choices the Chinese make. There are three core futures possible for China. At least this is the way the US government is looking at it. First, we could have a weak and dysfunctional China. Uh, second, we could have a slow growth, modest capabilities China. And third, we could have a strong China. Not unlike the China we had uh, until about two years ago, two or three years ago. So let me mention first a weak, dysfunctional China. This would be characterized by virtually separate regional governments, strong coastal economies, weaker inland provinces, and an inward, not a global stance. The China dream would be eclipsed by a world of rumor and worry, scandal, rapid change, and a diminished party, uh, where the party's voice would simply be one among many coherent military power projection would be difficult, if not impossible. We would be less worried about China's capacity to project force in this situation. We would be very worried about uh, instability in China, which could have a ripple effect in the region. The second China is a slow growth, modest capabilities China that can can be expected to be less confident than today's China, but more coherent than a weak and dysfunctional China. Social media will have emerged as a powerful force and an important element in China's identity. Though strongly opposed by the party, the censors would be able to subdue social media only part of the time. The many millions of voices heard in social media increasingly define the future in this China as a miasma of worry and rumor 
aspiration, and accusation. Though defined factions would have emerged within the standing committee of the Politburo, it would remain a coherent functioning body. This China would have some similarity to the China in the 1970 to 1990 period. The economy would be moderately strong, but would have to address both the systemic weaknesses of the current Chinese economy and offset the political and economic impact of the measures imposed to correct its deficiencies, that is, reducing reliance on exports, redirecting assets to strengthen consumer economy, uh, uh, and reducing and eliminating subsidies for state-owned enterprises, uh, eliminating special banking arrangements, increasing wages, and so on. So it would have a lot to do very tough choices, a lot of pressure. We could expect to see military spending level off or even decline in this China. We could see a more cooperative, constructive foreign policy. Uh, a weakened but functional China is probably the preferred option for the region from the point of view of the U.S the West and the international community. I say probably. It may not be, but it seems as though it is. But what if we had a strong China? Uh, that would be much the same as the China we have encountered until recently. It aspires to global leadership. It is actively constructing a national narrative that includes the China dream. It remains plagued by corruption. The economy continues to grow at about six, maybe six and a half percent, uh, although we know now that the economy is growing at a slower rate. The security military budgets would grow apace. Relations with the U.S. and the West would remain tricky, while relations with neighbors, including India, Vietnam, Philippines, and Japan, would remain uneven and sometimes confrontational. Relations with Russia would revolve around energy and anti-U.S. sentiment, although this could change with a Russian-European rapprochement. Cyber intrusion would remain a serious problem, and a continuing, and continuing efforts by Beijing to penetrate U.S. computer networks in the communications, energy, transportation, research, regulatory, and highly restricted government and military areas would be a severe problem. We could expect China to use its sophisticated com computer capabilities to attempt to shape U.S. options and limit projections of U.S. power, both soft power and hard power. China could continue to pursue its territorial and resource claims in East Asia, but would invite greater U.S. presence. Depending upon the economy and other themes discussed here, we could see either an ambitious, expansive China with an expansive foreign policy and growing military budgets, or a more restrained China and with more modest foreign policy goals with increased resources focused on internal security. The latter of these two options would be in the American interest. Just to comment on Japan's view, within Japan there's a general view that in the year 2030 China will be stronger or about the same. Except in the economic and demographic areas, Japan expects there to be a continued lack of transparency in China's military expenditures across a wide range of areas combined with continuous attempts to demonstrate military prowess by systematically violating Japanese territorial waters. As they say, all politics is local. Okay. Furthermore, as China's domestic prosperity becomes increasingly tied to the prosperity of East Asia, there will be an even greater incentive to seek control over the terms of the region's security and to change uh, the status quo. 
It's likely that China will continue to try to demonstrate its hegemony in the region through the year 2030, according to the Japanese. It will try to incrementally replace elements of the old with a new security order that's more firmly tied to China's economic and commercial presence. Um, this course that China's likely to take will not deter Washington or Tokyo. Washington will continue to rebalance to Asia. Japan will respond by strengthening its military and continue to increase its defense budget. Japan does not expect drastic improvements in China's capability, military capabilities. And given the continued strengthening of the U.S.-Japan alliance, it is expected that despite Chinese belligerency in hot spots like the South China Sea, efforts to change the status quo in the East Asian region will not prevail. And I think I'll close with that. Uh, gives you a bit of an overview of what we're thinking about through the year 2030. Thank you.